Good to be here today. Good to see you all. This is uh, one of our quieter times of the year. It's always one of our quieter times of the year. Uh, students are gone. It's winter. People get, uh, who can get away from Johannesburg to warmer places tend to do that. Um, so, but it's good to be here. Good to see the heat is out and warming everybody. Um, and good to be able to, to go through the word which is what is our guide for life, gives us direction and uh, gives us uh, our place in, in this world and also the next. And we're in Hebrews chapter 9. And Hebrews is, is it's, an, it's an interesting book and it, it, it completes a very powerful idea that, that God gave in the Old Testament right from the time of the giving of the Mosaic Law. Uh, with the people of Israel when they came out of captivity and on Sinai starting with the Ten Commandments and uh, all the rest that went with them and the whole system of sacrificial offerings which um, people look at it today and they think well what, what's all that about? I mean what, is, what does it actually mean <coughs> at all? And why did they do it? And uh, what's, what's the point of it? Of offering a sacrifice of an animal for sin it seems somewhat archaic and out of place and primitive and all of that kind of thing and yet it it put forth a very powerful idea that God wanted to get through to us and embed in the, the psyche of the people who decide to follow him and uh, by the first century there were many people who admired uh, tremendously the ideas that are in the Old Testament, and I'm talking about people in, in, in the world as, as a whole. And the Apostle Paul came across many of these people uh, worshipping with Jews in, in synagogues and was able to convert them to Christ because they understood this idea of the necessity for atonement, the necessity for, for blood to be shed because blood represents life. And the necessity for that in order to pay for sin, life, the price for sin is life and blood represents that life. And so uh, that's a very powerful idea in the Old Testament which finds its ultimate fulfillment in the sacrifice of Christ and Him giving His life for sin. But here um, in Hebrews chapter 9, and Brother Justice has uh, gone through some of the first few verses there with regard to the tabernacle, and those who were here last week, I think most of you uh, here last week, were able to see the whole idea of sacrifice. Thank you. <laughs> is, it, is it working any better than it was before? I have no idea. I'm just holding it here like a lollipop. <laughs> Oh, you've got this area of the archaic term itself. <laughs> so, but there are a couple of them here to, this morning, I see. Um, but nevertheless, let's get back to the idea of the study. Can you, is it working? Working? No. Can I, or can I just put it down? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, what, what we have with regard to these first few verses is, is a a description of the tabernacle which represented um, God's presence amongst His people in the Holy of Holies, that inner sanctum, if you like, of, of the sanctuary. And so, and, and the outer place where, where cleansing took place and where the priest served in, in the temple, uh, in this earthly sanctuary which became part of the temple. Um, and the temple was actually built around the sanctuary. Uh, the, first of all, Solomon's temple, the great temple of Solomon, uh, was, was built around the sanctuary. At the heart of the temple is the sanctuary. And the sanctuary had this holy place in the Holy of Holies. But initially it was built in the wilderness and built um, uh, out of canvas and, and wood and metal um, and had very important items within that that was representative of how God worked amongst His people. And that's what he talks about in verse 4 because he talks uh, with regard to the, the altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold. 
in which was a golden jar holding manna. Of course, manna was what God provided in the wilderness in order to feed the people. And as a reminder of this, there was this golden jar holding the manna. And Aaron's rod, of course, that, that's what Aaron used before Pharaoh, which budded. And the tables of the covenants, the, the Ten Commandments written in stone that represented the law, were represented of those first ten, which represented the, the covenant, the, the law. Um, and above it were the cherubim, the, the fiery ones, it was like, the, you know, uh, with wings coming out and touching each other in the middle. So you had this, this, this tabernacle, and then you had on either side these cherubim with the wings touching in, in the middle. That's, that's what you had. Um, and he says that they overshadowed the mercy seat. That's the Ark of the Covenant. That's the, the table of the Ark of the Covenant called the mercy seat. And so called because that's where the, the blood was sprinkled for the sins of the people. And he says something very interesting at, at the end of verse 5. He says, but of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Well, why? <laughs> it's, very, it's actually quite fascinating that he makes a statement like that, that he talks about all these things and he says, but there's not much we can say about these things right now. We can't talk about them much anymore. And the reason was, well, they weren't there anymore. This Ark of the Covenant, the original Ark of the Covenant, wasn't there anymore. Hadn't been there since the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonians in 586 BC, 586 years before the birth of Christ. So, you, you know, essentially 600 years, these things hadn't been around, which is quite fascinating because these, these things that were so representative of what God had done, the might and the power of God and what He had done and what He's just mentioned, and these were all there in the Holy of Holies, and he, he's, saying, he's saying to them, well, none of these things are anymore, or there anymore. We can't talk about them anymore, because they're not there. And so why is that, why is that of any, any kind of, of significance at all? That this golden jar that contained the manna and this, uh, the, the rod that budded was not there anymore. And the Ten Commandments, these two tablets are that had the Ten Commandments written in stone, why does he even, what's the big deal here? Well, you know what the big deal is? Is that this is, in many respects, very typical of where God's Word works and is going to continue to work. Is that physical representations are, are just outward stuff. They're just outward things. And ultimately, not important and not intended to last and that's part of what he's trying to get through to these people because remember this is this is written in Jeru to Christians in Jerusalem who after all the excitement you know there, there sometimes there's this uh, very big period of excitement in the early church it must have been really exciting to be in Jerusalem with the early church with all that energy, with all that fire um, in, in the preaching and the teaching, with the Holy Spirit working through the apostles, doing all these miracles, um, and so many people coming to Christ, a very exciting time. And then all of it, the, 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 but this is now decades later, because that was after 33 AD, and this is now 63 AD approximately, 33, 43, 53, 63. 30 years, and a lot of those people are now um, in their 50s and 60s and 70s, and there's a, a few new people, and they've got all these memories of all that time of excitement, and it's like the glory days. They talk about the glory days. And this is what people like to do, you know. Very often, people talk about, you know, their school days and their accomplishments at school days or university, and you know, those are the glory days. Well, hopefully, that's not the case, <laughs> not the case for you. Hopefully that with you in your life, the glory days are the are glory days of now, right? So I, I never look, I, I tend to be forward looking rather than backward looking. 
And so I never think about the, the glory days as being in the past, but the glory days as still developing and, and here and still happening. Um, but definitely Jerusalem in 63 AD for Christians is a very much less exciting place than it was in 33 AD. That's just the truth of, the truth of the matter. And the apostles are gone. They're no longer in Jerusalem. And the church in Jerusalem is no longer really the center of all the activity. It's not the place. It's not the happening place. This is not where things are, are really going on. And so, yeah, because it's less exciting, they're looking at um, the temple. And the temple is, it, it's, this is the most glorious place. It's, you know, on the way to church, you know, go past Santon City. And look at it and think, gee, this place has really grown. All those wonderful buildings and fantastic buildings. And it's quite impressive to, to look at, at Santon City. And, you know, it makes Joburg as a city look quite, you know, a, a shabby place by comparison. And that's, you know, Santon City is where it's all, ha all happening, you know. And so you look at that, that and they're looking at the, the temple. And this incredible temple that was built by Herod. And, and over, over 40 years he worked on this temple, although most of it was done fairly quickly, but the, all the improvements were, were still going on with regard to this wonderful temple. And, and so they, they looked at it and they felt that, you know, they were quite shabby by comparison. And they thought, well, maybe they've left something great for something less because all the physical trappings were not there. They didn't have a temple, the Christians in Jerusalem. They didn't have fantastic structures where they could point people to and say, look, see, you know, see what a wonderful place that is. You know, if we want to point people to a structure in, for the church um, here in, in the Johannesburg region, where, what do we, where, do we, where do we go to? Where do we go to? Um, Baxter, what's, what's the impressive place <laughs> for the church? Is there no impressive place for the church? Is that, is that what you say by shaking your head at me like that? Hey, what, what kind of, hey, what kind of response is that so early in the morning? You know? <laughs> what do we do? We take people to a place like Benoni, the Benoni Church building, right? That's probably the, the most impressive structure that we have in the Church of Christ. No, no, I still like it. I think after all these years, and it's getting a little bit old, but after all these years, I think, I, I think it was quite well put together. Um, except that it leaks half the time, but, you know, I mean, it looks good in any case. It looks good, huh? But the Alawani, doesn't it? Huh? But, but still, um, when it comes to, to Jerusalem, they, there's nothing really that impressive. And so they're looking back. They're tending to look back to the old ways, the old religion, the way it used to be. When they would, they would go to the temple and when, you know, all the finery and that. And look, it's, it's a very impressive. Uh, there was a lot of wealth there in Jerusalem. A lot of money, really. A lot of money. How much money? Well, when, when Titus destroyed, and this is just seven years away from the writing of this book, when Titus destroyed the temple, and I think I might have told, I'm not sure if I've told, told it here, but um, if I have, it will be recently, and, and forgive me for repeating it. But Titus took all that wealth back to Jerusalem to his father Vespasian. Took all that wealth back, and you've got, you've got pictures of it, You've got murals of it, murals, uh, stone representations of it um, in, in Rome. And what did he do with a lot of that money? He built the Colosseum. <laughs> so it went from the temple to the Colosseum, which was the complete opposite of the temple, right? Because this is a place of entertainment where, where people were ripped to shreds by wild animals or, or cut each other to pieces with, you know, all kinds of um, uh, war, uh, instruments of war. This, this was the Colosseum. That was built with the wealth of the temple in Jerusalem. We still got that today. That Colosseum is still standing. That pagan um, Colosseum is still standing. It's quite an impressive looking place even today. All right. So that's the kind of, that's the wealth. That's what Vespasian, the emperor of Vespasian, used to build the Colosseum was the wealth 
that he didn't just he didn't just that didn't take all of it by the way he was able to upgrade the whole of Rome including all the aqueducts or all the water supply and all of that kind of thing with that wealth it's a lot of money there was a lot of wealth in Jerusalem it was very impressive it was like you know the Santon of, of the ancient world the, the New York of the ancient world it was that's where the wealth was okay so you can imagine <clears throat> these Christians and they know you know things aren't exciting anymore and it's not a big deal and it seems it's so so ordinary and and then you've got the temple, the Jewish temple, and it seems so impressive. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying to them, hey, you know what was even more impressive? You know what was even more impressive? Having the Ark of the Covenant, that was impressive. You know? This um, acacia, it was like an acacia cabinet, overlaid with gold, and, and you know, with, with these golden cherubim. And can you imagine being able to look in there if you were a high priest and see this a golden jar that had manna, preserved manna in that jar, and the, the rod that had budded, and the Ten Commandments, gee, the Ten Commandments, imagine being able to look on those, eh? wouldn't that be impressive? That's quite fantastic, and yet, it's not there anymore, it's gone, because after all, this is just a physical thing. And physical things don't last. God's made them that way. And even though this was so representative of what He had done, that's all it was. It was just a representation of something temporary. Where God had greater things in mind. And you know what the greater thing in mind was? What all of this was ultimately representative of Christ. And the temple. That He built. Which is the church. The sanctuary. His sanctuary. And what he was going to do, the ultimate sacrifice for sin, not this blood of bulls and goats which he starts to talk about. So that's, that's what he's, that's what he's it's, it's quite a subtle um, reference that he's making and saying, oh, we can't speak about these things in detail. And it's almost like I read that and my you know, initial response was, why even bother to mention them? Exactly because he's trying to get this point across. There's something bigger and better. Part of something bigger and better. <coughs> than what is out there, bigger and better than what is out there, even though sometimes what is out there looks physically imposing and impressive. We are part of something bigger and better in Christ. He says in verse 6, Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, Performing the divine worship. So you've got this, what they have, are still observing in Jerusalem. The priests going in and out. Going through all these rituals that gave them meaning and purpose and stability and direction in their lives as, as, as Jewish people in Jerusalem, in Judea. But into the second, this is where the presence of God was, the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest enters once a year. Only one person can go in there. And once a year. And that's the high priest. This is the pinnacle of their worship. The high priest going in there. Not without taking blood which he offers for himself. And the sins of the people committed in ignorance. So he goes in and he offers a sacrifice for sin. Every year, once a year, and it gets shifted forward, once a year. And the Jews still have that concept in their minds today, because every year on the Day of Atonement, they go into the, um, the uh, synagogue, and they say, God, please write my name in the Book of Life for one more year. One more year. Write my name in the Book of Life. One more year. So it's this idea of one year at a time, one year at a time. Sin's been forgiven. One year at a time. The blood sprinkled on the altar to forgive sins. One year at a time. That's, that's the idea. And verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. So, um, the Holy Spirit has a message with us that the, 
the way into, into God's holy place has not yet been accomplished with this tabernacle, which is a symbol, verse 9, for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifice are offered which cannot make the worshipper perfect in, in conscience. And that just makes a whole lot of sense to me. You can't kill an animal and, and offer his blood to God and say, There you are, God. There's some blood for my, for my sin. I've killed something valuable to me. I've killed this animal. And let that take care of my conscience. And let just one more year, God, one more year. Forgive my sins. Write my name in the book of life. Do that for just one more year. No, <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for you. It doesn't make sense to, to anybody. Except as something for which it was meant to be. Symbolic. Of the need for blood to be shed. For forgiveness of sin. Because blood represents life. And that year... Yeah, sin is something that is evident in every single human being. It's part and parcel of who we are. Inescapable. There are goodnesses. We're capable of doing good. But fundamentally, what defines us is sin. And these things are only symbolic since they relate, verse 10, only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. It's not a physical tabernacle. That, just, that is to say, not of this creation. It's an eternal tabernacle it's a spiritual tabernacle and this is something that we have to really internalize and grasp because this is what the representative of something that is greater that we belong to there is no physical representation of the sacrifice for sin today there is that physical representation was done by Christ once for all there is no physical tabernacle. There is no um, physical Jerusalem anymore. That is the place where God dwells amongst His people. Only the spiritual Jerusalem of which we are part. So we don't need to worry about a physical Jerusalem anymore. A physical tabernacle. Because there's something greater. What is greater? This spiritual tabernacle. That's the real thing. So what is the point here? The point is ultimately this. The physical is not ultimate reality. This physical world is not ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is the spiritual world. This physical world is just temporary. And we belong to something that is spiritual and therefore eternal. That's very important to grasp that idea. Because it means that there's bigger things that we are part of. We are part of something bigger than this physical world. And Christ entered, and how did He enter? Verse 12. And not through the blood of, go of goats and calves, but through His own blood. For he entered the holy place once and for all, having attained eternal redemption. He did it once for all time, not year by year by year, but once for all time. His sacrifice was sufficient for all time, not just for then and in the future, but also the past. The blood of Christ being shed on, shed, shed on the cross wasn't just effective going forward, it was also effective going backward. In other words, Christ died for the sins of Adam too, and Eve too, also. Okay. And all the people throughout all the, the generations, He died for that. And that's why this concept of, of uh, the concept that God gave with regard to atonement is so important, because the year by year by year, say one more year, one more year, just one more year God, just one more year. What is he doing? He's pushing the sins forward. 
this, the, pushing the sins forward to when? To when Christ died and this blood that is effective once for all time, effective for once for all time, could forgive sins for all time, past and present. Very important concept. Why? Because people still get the idea of, even with regard to baptism, some people uh, uh, with baptism, they think, Dear, but I could just be baptized just before I die. Then all my sins are forgiven. <laughs> Have you ever heard that thought expressed? Okay. Where in fact the reality is that once you have been baptized into Christ, that is your state from then on. That your, the forgiveness of sins from Christ is once for all time. That means also for you once for all your time. For all my time. That's what the blood does. It forgives our sins for that whole, for, for the whole time. This is much bigger than any sort of physical representation because Christ did it for all time and, he, and He's part of the spiritual tabernacle. And um, in verse 30 He says, For the, if the blood of the goats and bulls and the ash of the heifer sprinkling um, those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. In other words, just outwardly. So this is just an outward representation. It was never, it was never, God never really was saying this actually forgives sins. And that's why verse 14 is so important. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit God came to earth offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God so the, the idea the idea here with regard to this is that okay who's going to die for my sin who's going to take care of my sin seeing as I can't on my own I can't really deal with my own sin okay I can't go before God and look at him in the eyes squarely in the eye and say Okay, God, <laughs> I'm all right, uh, and nobody can do that. It's not possible. So, what happens? You've got this. Is what happens is that Jesus Christ, God decided that because we couldn't, even before the creation of the world, He knew we couldn't deal with us. He knew we were going to sin. We, if, given the given the choice between doing good and evil. Yeah, we are quite capable of doing plenty of evil in our life. We're quite capable of that. And that's why he made this commitment before the foundation of the world that he would himself come to this earth. The, 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 the one thing that most, that so many people find completely crazy was the only thing that could help us deal with our sin is that because sin has to be paid for, it can't just be forgiven and has to be paid for. Wrong has to be set right. Things have to be said right. There has, there has to be justice. It's built into the very nature of God Himself. He decided He was going to come in the, in the human form and die, give His life, shed His blood. The price for sin is life, both physical and spiritual. Okay? He experienced what it was like to be separated from God Himself part of the God here, and he had experienced what it was like to be separated from, from God itself. And so his blood, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. He cleansed our consciences. Why? So that we can do what? Go out there and just do whatever we want. <laughs> and have all the fun in the world, and not take God into account in our lives. No, that having been cleansed, that what is our, our primary purpose in life, is to serve the living God in whatever work we do, in whatever, whatever profession we do, in whatever walk we, we take in this life, the primary purpose is to serve God through that, through whatever we do. We serve God. When we get that right, we're going in the right direction. Because God Himself has given us this opportunity for eternal life. And so He says in verse 15, uh, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So the old covenant, 
is gone. We've made that pretty clear. Um, Jeremiah made that pretty clear. This is a new covenant. This is, a, this is not the outward one with animal sacrifice and all of that thing, which is highly representative of the true one. But this is the actual true one. And Jesus is the mediator of this new covenant, so that since a death, his death, has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. Okay? That's just in case you're not too sure about what happened to all the people who were under the first covenant, who just had the balls and goats, right? Okay. What happened to their sin ultimately? The, this is why the blood of Christ is effective going backwards and forwards. Because his sacrifice was also effective for those sins that were committed under the first covenant. It's effective going backwards and forwards. It's a very important concept. Because what forgives sin? It's like this, uh, the blood of Christ only forgives sin going forward and, all, and before Christ God just forgave sin. No, it doesn't work like that. Because sin still has to be paid for. So what, what is the only thing, the only thing that forgives sin? The only thing is the blood of Christ. Him giving His life. He gave His life. That is the only thing that results in forgiveness of sins. Nothing else does it. And so that's why it's effective for the sins committed under the first covenant. And so those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And so that's why he says, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. And it's almost like this is technical, right? But it's, it's just putting things in place. It's putting things in perspective. It's trying to say to you that in order for this covenant, in order for this will, in order for this testament to come into effect, there had to be a death. And the death was that of, of Jesus Christ. God, through the eternal spirit, came to earth in human form and died for our sin. That's what, that's what it's talking about. For a, co a covenant is only valid when, verse 17, when men are dead... For it's never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses, all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and the ghosts of water and sprinkled scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And for, especially for, the, the Jews who were receiving this the first time in 63 AD, this is all very familiar to them. It's less familiar to us today as, as Christians, but it's, it's like that the whole of the Old Testament is, is painting this, this wonderful picture of what God is going to do through Christ. And part of that picture is the sacrificial system under the, the Mosaic law and the the creating of this new covenant where we have this relationship where it's possible for us to have a relationship with God and to be saved for all time. It puts us right with God in spite of the fact that we are sinful people. Um, and we no longer live lives that are sin-directed. doesn't mean we don't ever sin anymore because we do. That's the reality of it. But we don't sit there in we, we don't we don't have to sit there in misery and think, you know, God came now, he would just blow me away. <laughs> because I'm such a miserable human being. Can't deal with myself. It gives you the tools to work on yourself. Because of the blood of Christ that is forgiven. And that the primary tool is that we become servants of Christ. That, that that whatever you do in life, that is always there right in the forefront of all your decisions to go ahead and, and do that. And it might mean that sometimes you take tough decisions that, not, that look like they're not in your best interests when it comes to uh, work choice, when it comes to partnership choice, when it comes to um, what, whatever you do, um, that what is first in your life is the fact that you're a Christian. That's what it needs to be. Because 
the sacrifice is that great and the rewards are that great and so we do it for that for that reason um, In the same way, verse 21, I'm going to close off with a couple of verses here. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And this is, the, this is one of the key points of all of this, because they use blood sprinkled to cleanse. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That was the message God sent with all these Old Testament sac blood sacrifices, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies, the copies of the things of the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. In other words, you look at the whole Old Testament sacrificial system which they're looking at, and they're looking at the temple, and it looks so wonderful. And all the priests and their, and their great robes and the pomp and the ceremony and the, and the blood and, and, the, 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 and it all seems so impressive. And he's saying, these are just copies. They're just copies. It's not the real thing. You know? You haven't got the, you haven't got the picture of, of Mona Lisa on your wall. It's just a copy. You know? What's the difference? Well, a few hundred million, actually. You know, so if you've got a, a picture of Mona Lisa on your wall at, at home and people come in and say, yeah, it's quite a fantastic picture. Yeah, yeah, there's got this one hanging in the Louvre as well, you know. Uh, except I paid, you know, a hundred grand for this and the one in, in the Louvre is, is worth about 350 million dollars. Okay, so which one do you want? If you have a choice, which one would you take? The one in the Louvre or the one on my wall? Alright? Um, there's no... It, it, there's no comparison, is there? One's just a copy. And so the whole sacrificial system was just a copy. It wasn't the real thing. It wasn't the real deal. This is the real deal. We part of the real deal. It's real. The physical world is, is only a, uh, a temporary thing. We something bigger, part of something bigger in Christ. That goes on into eternity. And that should influence all the decisions that we make. Don't be impressed with this world. It's not that impressive. And it doesn't last. And just as Aaron's rod didn't last and the, and the table of the commandments didn't last. And seven years after writing of this, the temple was gone. Gone. Every stone torn down. Gone. Never to be rebuilt. Never to be rebuilt. Why? Because it was just a copy. This is the real thing. Let's have a break.